Good morning, and welcome to the Museum of the San Marone Valley, Valley's virtual speaker series. I am Dan Dunn, the director of the museum. For purposes of full disclosure, uh, we were advised by Comcast yesterday that we would have periodic outages of the museum's Wi-Fi system. Would for our purposes this morning that my desktop computer is actually a very large paperweight and I'm on my phone instead. So I apologize ahead of time for any lack of uh, audio visual quality, but we will soldier on. Last month, museum curator Beverly Lane shared with us the creation and history of the East Bay Regional Park District. Today, in celebration of the museum's current exhibition, Stir Crazy Quilts, Quilting During the Pandemic, we are proud to have textile artist Dolores Miller from the Art Quilt Associates as our speaker. Both traditional and art quilts are visually appealing, but while traditional quilts can be functional, art quilts are created as an artistic expression. Ms. Miller is a textile artist living in San Jose. Her art often explores the vastness and wonder of the universe and our relationship to it. She's a board member of the Studio Art Quilt Association, Association whose mission it is to promote the art quilt. She's been a juror at national textile art events and curated several regional art quilt exhibitions. And this morning, we got to find out what Dolores created during the pandemic. Please use the chat window at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you have. Feel free to send in questions at any time during the presentation and we'll address them at the end. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome in Dolores Miller. Dolores? Thank you, Dan. I'll start my presentation here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak at the museum today. Um, I know this is a little different from the talks you've had in the past, but it's my privilege to tell you a little bit about art quilts and about the organization that I've served in various capacities, Studio Art Quilt Associates, known as SACWA. I'll also take you on the journey through my experience making a COVID quilt, which is the theme of the exhibit currently showing at the museum. I hope you'll make the time to see this show if you haven't already, and that this presentation will give you an added dimension to viewing the wonderful works in it. First of all, what is a quilt? We're familiar with quilts. We think we're familiar with quilts anyway. If we're lucky, we get to snuggle under one of them at night. If we're really, really lucky, we've had them passed down to us across the generations. But what do we mean when we talk about a quilt? Or more precisely, what do we mean by quilting? Quilting is an action, a technique of stitching together layers of textiles, fabric usually, and often, but not always, of filling or batting. This technique dates back thousands of years and produces a layered and stitch textured material that can provide warmth, insulation, and protection. The material created by this process can be used in a variety of ways. For example, quilting has been used in armor with its multiple layers and its fillings serving to protect the wearer from penetration of weapons and projectiles. The Korean tunic um, shown here and its helmet are made from layers of cotton and hemp with copper and iron plates in between. The close-up of the helmet shows the intricate stitching used to attach the layers. Bulletproof vests of the 1960s made of layers of Kevlar, a woven synthetic fiber, were also quilted. 
And we see here, even today, you can go on the internet and buy a quilted um, protective armor if you have $1,395 to spare. And here we have quilting used in a modern commercial application. Though technically the layers are not stitched, they're mechanic mechanically bond bonded to produce a textured surface that can purportedly clean with better efficacy. We are generally, however, most familiar with quilts as bed coverings. This is an image of the Tristan quilt taken from the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which dates from the 14th, late 14th, early 15th uh, century. It's linen and tells the story in 14 scenes of the oppression of Cornwall by King Languis of Ireland and his champion, the Morold, and the battle of Sir Tristan with the latter on behalf of his uncle, King Mark. At least that's what the Victorian Albert says. But it's all done by the intricate stitch work that holds the layers together. In the United States, what we refer to as traditional quilts were in colonial times, whole cloth quilts, similar in construction to the Tristan quilt, which you just saw. By the 19th century, however, the availability of cloth due to the industrialization um, of manufacture, of its manufacture and more free time for some people anyway, led to quilts such as the type that are shown here. Now, colloquially, when we talk about a quilt, we tend to talk about patchwork quilts. That is quilts where um, fabric has been cut up and sewn back together. That's a way of making a quilt top. The quilting is the attaching of the layers together. So the surface layers can be pieced, embellished, embroidered, and otherwise adorned to make an aesthetically pleasing project, object. Even though these objects are primarily functional, this is clearly not the most efficient way to make a bed covering if you're cold. There is clearly an element of artistic choice, artic, artistic intent and artistic expression. So what do we mean to differentiate when we say an art, art quilt. What are we talking about when we say an art quilt? According to Sakwa, an art quilt is a creative visual work that is layered and stitched or references this form of lay, stitched layered structure. So you can see the working definition or Sakwa's working of definition gives a a lot of um, leeway for artistic expression and um, what a quilt is. Now you may have seen Amish quilts or the quilts of G's Bend exhibited in museums and fine art gala venues because their aesthetic qualities are now rightly recognized and rightly valued. However, these objects have been retrospectively perceived as art. It wasn't the primary intent of their creators. Now, I'm going to show you some works from an exhibition that Sakwa had, has on the road called 50 Years of Innovative Art, um, which is based on a book of the same title by Nancy Bavor, Lisa Ellis, Martha Seelman, and Sandra Sider. Now, while they may incorporate traditional quilt making techniques, art quilts, like other contemporary art media, may also include non-traditional materials and methods. The works can evoke any emotion, address any topic, be any size.
they can be representational. They can be abstract. They can be brilliant in color. They can be subdued in their color palette. They can be richly detailed. Or starkly simple. They can even be three dimensional. But what they have in common is they're all original artworks. California quilt artist Yvonne Porcella sent out 50 letters to artists and friends with the idea of establishing a place for art quilts in the world of contemporary art. Sakwa, founded in 1989, was the result of that call. Sakwa currently has more than 4,000 members worldwide and is a volunteer-driven community of people dedicated to its mission to promote the art quilt. Sakwa's mission and its vision that the art quilt be universally respected as a fine arts medium are meant to align the perception of art quilts with the intention of the quilt artist. Because of its legacy as a domestic object and perhaps having been seen as women's work or craft, the art quilt has not easily made its way into fine arts um, and fine art galleries and museums. Sakwa works to increase public appreciation for the art quilt and supports its members' uh, artistic and professional growth to fulfill its mission and make its vision a reality. Sakwa works to raise public awareness of the art quilt through exhibitions, and presentations such as the one you're listening to right now and through its publications, like the book I referred to earlier. There are juried global and regional exhibitions, which we've been increasingly successful at getting shown in museums and other public spaces, in addition to traditional quilt venues. Virtual exhibitions and galleries hosted on SACWA's website, www.sacwa.com, are available to anyone with internet access. We also have trunk shows which are available to travel around the world with many art quilts that you can hold in your hand, look at and discuss. And something you don't often get to do with artworks. Directly as a result of COVID, we have a program of textile talks which are every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time which are in collaboration with other fiber and textile organizations covering a wide variety of subjects of interest to textile and fiber artists. And all of these talks are available on SACWA's YouTube channel. All of SACWA's global exhibitions and many of its regional exhibitions um, have a catalog produced with them. And Sakwa also produces books and magazines. Sakwa has a plethora of volunteer run membership programs, providing artistic and professional growth in a supportive environment. Though Sakwa is a global organization, through its regions and local connections, members are able, when we're not in quarantine anyway, to form in person communities. Some regions cover huge geographic areas like Europe, Middle East or Oceania, 
and some have extensive regional activities, but any group of members can create a local connection. And each of those groups is, is unique. Some focus on critique and fiber art trends, others do field trips. The only requirement is that they be open to any and all SAQWA members. Our first conference, in view of the fact that we're a global organization, was to be held, held outside of the contiguous United States, was to have been in 2020. And yes, COVID. In two weeks, it was pivoted to a virtual event, thanks to the hard work of our tiny staff and our numerous volunteers. We will finally make it to Toronto, fingers crossed, a week from today, April 27th. We will continue, however, to have virtual conferences after the past um, three virtual events, which were very successful, because they allowed any member from anywhere around the world to participate. SACWA seminar is our flagship educational event. Each year, there's a six to eight week deep dive into a relevant topic. For 2023, it was material matters with speakers, resource lists, projects, and discussion groups. And I could go on and on and on, but I won't. The other programs are shown on this slide and they all have in common the goal of providing opportunities for our members to pursue their goals, be they artistic or professional. But the most important benefits are the personal connections and the sense of community created within the organization and the chance to be in turn a learner, a colleague, and a leader. My journey through SACWA as a volunteer, in my journey, I've been fortunate enough to play all three of those roles with a lot of learning by doing along the way. I've been a member since 2009. Um, I call myself an accidental co-rep. In 2013, I had just retired from um, my original job. And the person who was to have been a co-rep suddenly had to step down for personal reasons. And I said, sure, why not? I'll give it a try. And I've never regretted that decision. From there, um, I was on the regional exhibition committee. Our region was one of the first to have a full exhibition program similar to our global exhibition program. I curated two regional exhibitions at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, which I hope you all have an opportunity to visit, um, at what was then called the Fiber Space Program. And I curated those exhibitions in 2014, 2016. What you see in this, this image is the postcard from the second of those exhibits. I was voted onto the SACWA board in 2017. One of the opportunities that I was so thrilled that SACWA gave me was to organize uh, an exploring contemporary art group. Many, if not most of SACWA's members come from a traditional quilt background. We're comfortable talking about our materials. We're comfortable talking about our techniques, but not so comfortable talking about art. So I created this group to provide a comfortable place to be uncomfortable learning to talk about art. In 2019, I became the chair of the education committee, which is the umbrella organization for many of the programs you saw in the previous slide. And in 2019, I became a board vice president and my term on the board and as vice president will um, end at the end of this month. My personal quilting journey started much earlier than my SACWA one. I sewed from a very early age and was a serial crafter 
but had no formal art background except for the occasional class here and there. I dabbled in art during my professional years as an analytical chemist. Like so many other people at the United States Bicentennial, I made this quilt from a pattern from McCall's Quilting Magazine. Though the pattern was a traditional log cabin, my color palette, palette was definitely non-traditional, adding pink, burgundy, yellow, and brown to the red, white, and blue. It's still on my bed, however, and it's still functional, though slightly the worse for wear. My early art quilts tended to be strongly geometric and high contrast, intensely colored. I like piecing, which appeals to the puzzle solver in me. I tend to work by setting myself some artistic challenge, some problem for me to solve. For example, in Downtown Blue, um, which was made as part of a monochromatic palette challenge for a group I belong to, I decided what's the fewest number of fabrics that I can use to create all the shading, all of the um, architectural details um, from this photo I took of a building in downtown San Jose. As I recall, there were four fabrics in it, um, one a gradated blue, which you can see in the sky there, which is one solid piece. In view from Rendezvous Point, The challenge was to rather than recreate the image that I took um, on vacation in the Grand Tetons, rather than try to recreate that image was to suggest, again, in a small number of pieces, the open sky and the craggy peaks. And in Whirlwind, This was working in silks. I had acquired a number of patterned silks, small pieces, and I challenged myself, could I take those very varied um, patterned silks and create a continuous arc surrounding the solid and striped pieces of the central motif? Now, I've been fascinated by the sky, the stars, and space in general since childhood. Growing up in Brooklyn, um, Brooklyn, New York, didn't give much of an opportunity for stargazing except for trips to the Hayden Planetarium. But a trip to the island of Antigua in the Caribbean as a young adolescent was life-changing. There, as I stood on the beach on a moonless night, stars kept appearing above me. The longer I stared, the richer and more detailed the view became. My galaxy series started entirely by accident, however. At a retreat in 2018, a friend let me play with her needle felting machine. And if you're not familiar with those, it's an instrument with a number of deadly sharp serrated needles that physically embed fibers into a substrate. I brought some brightly colored dryer lint that I'd bought from a fabric vendor and just started playing with colors and shapes. The spiral is one of my favorite shapes. And one of those experiments reminded me of a galaxy. Those early experiments led to a series of about 20 pieces in which I try to communicate that sense of awe and wonder I felt when looking at the night sky or when I now look at images taken by land or space telescopes. I spend far too much time on the NASA and JPL websites, looking at the images from the Hubble Space Telescope and now from the James Webb Space Telescope. My galaxy and constellation series are inspired by those images, but the designs are my own. In this series, I experimented with materials, the format, the embellishment, even making three-dimensional bowls like Galaxy 15 in the bottom right-hand corner. 
Galaxy 6 is wool substrate with, again, the cotton lint and some wool, wool roving, both hand and machine needle felted from both sides to create intense and diffuse color. It's hand embroidered, hand beaded, hand quilted with metallic thread to create the stars. You do what you have to do. You use what you have to use to create what you wanna create. Like everyone else in the world, I was tremendously, tremendously impacted by COVID. The first six months as an introvert gave me an excuse not to go out, not to socialize, but that soon wore thin. Like so many other quilters, as the contributors to the Stir Crazy um, quilt exhibition, I coped partially by making a quilt. In 2020, NASA published a 30th anniversary update of a photograph of the Earth taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft on its way into interstellar space. I looked at the two images and was both inspired and appalled. The original image was grainy and pixelated, the technology of the time having been pushed to the limits, pushed to its limits to acquire the photograph or the image. The earth was 0.12 pixels in that original image, a pale blue dot to quote Carl Sagan. And there's the dot in that image, you can barely see it. In the update, the earth is still tiny, but the image was clean and crisp and didn't, to my mind, reflect the, the reason that Sagan had fought so hard as a member of the Voyager imaging team to get that image taken. This is a quote from his book, Pale Blue Dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from somewhere else to save us from ourselves. This sentiment strongly resonated with me during the isolation of the pandemic. So here you see the top of my quilt, pale blue dot, being assembled. I had been collecting black and white pattern fabric for years with many ideas of what I'd do with it eventually and which tended to change from year to year. In this work, I chose to use the black and white to reflect the binary nature of the image data sent back from the Voyager spacecraft. The overall design emulates the pixelation and random noise of the original image. I made three small preparatory studies to work out fabric proportions and construction details. I chose to machine stitch raw edge strips rather than to piece the quilt top to make the edges slightly less distinct. The earth is a foil transfer onto the surface. I had to order a whole roll of foil from England to get just the color I wanted. The ver um, barely visible lens flares in the original image are pieces of magician scarf unraveled and stitched to the surface. Here's the backing fabric, which is a lovely um, cosmic fabric. I believe it's a Kaufman fabric. And you can see here the batting and the back of the front. And here's the finished piece. On the label, I put another quote from Sagan's 1994 book, Pale Blue Dot. Look at that dot. 
That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. I was fortunate enough to have Pale Blue Dot juried into Visions Interpretations, a prestigious textile exhibition at the Visions Museum of Textile Art in San Diego. That was my first pandemic travel in October of 22 to participate in the opening events. I conclude with an image of the first piece in a new series I'm working on called Pentimento, where I'm now painting my own fabric to further expand my artistic arsenal. So thank you all for your attention. I hope you get a chance to see this wonderful exhibition. Thank you to John and Dan for the invitation. And now I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dolores. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. And I will, as for one, never look at dryer. Oops, you broke up on me there. Okay. Now knows that Dolores's background is as an analytical chemist. And I have a question that came in for you. How do you do you how do you think your background in science and technology has influenced your art? Um actually throughout my life, my art and my science have sort of paralleled each other. And I use my art to exercise the parts of me that the creative parts that didn't get exercised in my technical career. Um, certainly my methodology that is setting up problems for me to solve, things like that, has a heavy influence in how I do my art, how I, you know, how I'm comfortable making my art. But the content is sort of what grabs me, what emotionally reaches me, what I'm thinking about. So the content, not so much the process. Oh, absolutely. So I was struck by your uh, Carl Sagan quote. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does that, uh, your cruising of the um, space telescope sites, uh, how, how does that idea form in your head? As you said, you you set a, a problem for yourself, basically, mm -hmm. and try to solve it. Mm -hmm. How does the those uh, sort of cosmic ideas um, work work to push you in that direction? I think it, it starts with what's fascinating to me. Um, what, what's, you know, again, you know, just, the, you know, it's awe inspiring to me that we're so small, we think we're so important, but we're so small and really cosmically insignificant. So for that, the problem is how do I present that idea in that medium? 
Um, and, then, and so then it becomes like smaller problems, okay? Well, so we need something, the earth small, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to physically rep recreate um, my inspiration. I'm trying to express a feeling, a feeling of something really tiny in something really large. So how do I do that? And so then it's a, 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 a um, feedback loop of, okay, well, this is, you know, the image is pixelated. Well, aha, you know, make little squares. That's, you know, pixels. Yeah. All right. So then how do you, um, what colors are you going to make it? Well, black and white binary zero one. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm, what kinds of fabrics am I going to use? I'm going to use commercial fabrics to represent mankind, right? I'm not going to hand dye these fabrics. Um, how much do I want the earth to stick out? Well, I want it to stick out a little. I mean, one of the funny things at um, Visions was people were playing like, where's Waldo? Um, <laughs> where Where is earth? Because it really deliberately is very hard to find yep, the earth it is. in there. You know, and people were going up there, you know, oh yeah, there, you know, and that's that was the point. That was the point. So I hope that answers your question somewhat. It did, and, and I, um, I cruised Dolores' site before we actually met on uh, on video, mm -hmm. and um, I was really struck with pale blue dot for that exact same reason. It's it it is difficult to find, and and that's the purpose of it. That's the purpose. Uh, um, of it. And so uh, I had said to Dolores way back when we started chatting about this, "Hey, I'd like to talk about pale blue dot," and she said, "Oh, we'll get there." So <laughs> I'm glad we did. Um, Another thing that Dolores did for me um, was I had asked Dolores to talk about the tradition of the quilting bee. Um, and um, so I'm going to just step out of this at this point because I need to. <laughs> and um, Dolores, can you talk about the myth versus the reality of the quilting bee? Certainly. I'll preface that with saying, um, I strongly recommend the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska's website. Um, one of the wonderful things that's happened is that there's really scholarly research on the history of quilting. And a lot of it is presented on their website. And fortunately, unfortunately, however you wanna look at it, um, some of the things that we've come to traditionally think we know about quilting aren't really the reality. They're like so much of history. We see it through the lens of the present. Um, quilting bees are sort of the um, shorthand discussion for community sewing. But the reality of the quilting bee is that that made up a very small proportion of how handwork was done. And for a number of reasons, um, in the um, early, and I'm talking about America right now, in the early um, earliest uh, textiles, you have to realize textiles were super expensive. People had, if you were really lucky, two sets of clothes. There wasn't fabric lying around. So this idea of having scraps of fabric where you got together in a community and and stitched it together, yeah, there was a lot of com a lot of communal work, but it wasn't necessarily represented by what retrospectively we look at as the quilting bee. That whole idea is really an outgrowth of industrial um, growth where fabric became more plentiful. And even then, um, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the majority, that wasn't how most people got together to do things. You got together to do things out of necessity, not to make these beautiful things that have survived through history. But that myth serves a purpose because it's, it, it fits in with our American narrative of, you know, pitching in to get things done. Um, so yeah, that's that's the myth versus the reality of the quilting bee. Got it. 
And, and I have to thank Dolores at, right now for sending me the article on the quilting bee from the International Quilt Museum. Uh, mm. that, that kind of put that idea in, my, in its place for me. So thanks for well, doing it. And I think in that article, it's very clear that, that the, the, the story resonates because it fits. But now there's the, you know, the research that says, well, this yeah. is how it really was. Yeah, yeah. And no, I, I, I do, I do understand both ends of that. So, mm -hmm. so thanks for sending that article to me. Uh, and I do encourage everybody to to cruise to uh, Dolores's website, um, and uh, I'll talk about Sakwa's website in a bit. Uh, Dolores, I think that's it for questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to thank you for coming on. I love seeing your work. Um, it, it kind of puts a, a different way of me looking at quilting um, together for me. So thank you for for coming, agreeing to come on, and then showing us uh, your tremendous artistic work. So thank, you. Th thanks for that. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And thank you all for viewing this morning. If you missed any of our earlier programs. You can find them by visiting the museum's website at museumsrv.org. Dolores's program will appear early next week. And as I said, make sure to go to Dolores's website and to SACWA's website at www.saqa.com. Join us next month uh, on Thursday, May 18th at 1130 when historian David Gotts will tell us about the maritime history of Tiburon and Belvedere. If you like these programs and want them to continue, we ask that you make a donation by going to the museum's homepage, museumsrv.org, and clicking on the Donate Now button. And now to the shameless portion of, um, the shameless promotion portion of this program, the museum's annual craft beer stroll through downtown Danville will be held next Thursday, April 27th from six to nine. Shops and Hops is a fun event as our past attendees can attest, we sell out. So get your tickets soon on the museum's website. The museum is also in need of volunteers. If you can give us some time, please contact us. I hope you've enjoyed Dolores' presentation today. I did. Uh, stay safe and thank you for watching.